for those of you who haven't had a chance to meet me yet, my name is Angela. I'm your trauma program manager. So a lot of people say, what does a trauma program manager do? We know what Lana does. She manages trauma. She manages us. She's, she, well, trauma program manager has many, many roles, and one of them is making sure that we maintain our level one statuses. And so for one of the aspects that you have to think about trauma is, is I know when I was a trauma nurse, I thought about trauma as the patient's a trauma patient when they're in the recess room. When they go into the ICU, now they're a critical care patient. When they go to the PCU, they're now a PCU patient. But in reality is when they come in as a trauma, they should be admitted to the trauma service and they're a trauma patient from the time they come to the time they're discharged. So my role as trauma program manager is making sure that our standards of care for our trauma patients are through their whole stay. So what our standards of care are based on our own protocols, based off of what ACS is, uh, determines us to have, and also what San Diego County determines that we should have. So we have several governing bodies that say what's best care, what's best standards for a trauma patient. So what I'm going to actually talk to you today about is the ACS Verified Trauma Level 1. So you hear this all the time, we're a Trauma Level 1 Center. What does that mean, that we're a Verified Trauma Level 1 Center? So let's talk about that. What we're going to go over today is verification. How this, what is verification, what does it mean to us, how do we, what, what do we have to do to get it? So we'll talk about who the ACS VRC is, what the process is, what does it take to be verified? What the results of our actual 2018 study, and many people, you probably don't even realize that we actually just went through verification in March of 2018, because a lot of it happens behind the scenes. And how did you contribute? So, American College of Surgeons Verification Review and Consultation Program, the VRC. The VRC is a spoke, if you will, of the ACS. So you hear American College of Surgeons all the time. You're all familiar with that term. So they divide out, if you will, into kind of spokes of a wheel. And one of the divisions is the Committee of Trauma, COT. So you'll hear that frequently um, throughout this. So the COT is the administrator of the verification review and consultation program. So that means they are the ones who decide who these people are and what were they going to be reviewing for us. <clears throat> so what the program does is validate overall, do we have the resources to care for our patients? And um, they come in, they do that by coming in and evaluating to see uh, an objective external evaluation to see, do we actually provide the care that we're saying that we can? So. The COT is responsible for producing the resources of optimal care of the injured patient book. This book is commonly referred to as the orange book. You might have heard that from time to time refer to the orange book. Juana has a copy of the orange book in her office. You can also find a copy of the orange book online at the ACS VRC website. If you're so interested and you're having a hard time sleeping and you really need something to help you put to sleep, good read. <laughs> um, but. The Orange Book is very important to us as a trauma center because it documents what the COT and the VCR, VRC says we are supposed to provide. So it lists all the criteria for every level of trauma, trauma level one, trauma level two, trauma level three, trauma level four. So you know if I'm a trauma level four and I want to become a trauma level three, what do I have to do to be verified as a trauma level three? So if I'm at trauma level one, what do I have to do to make sure I maintain this level of verification? And so what it does is it lists all the criteria and it ranks them. And what we have is for each criteria, they will call it a criteria deficiency or a CD. And there's two types of criteria deficiencies. There's a type one or a type two. So a type one criteria must be in place at the time of the verification site survey visit. So, if, this is, if you have a deficiency, a critical deficiency in a type one criteria, you will not be verified. You will not make verification. Then there is a type two. This one is considered less urgent, but still important. And you have up 
if you, you can have up to three type 2 deficiencies during your review, and they will say, okay, you get verified for one year, go ahead and submit to us when you fixed these deficiencies, <coughs> and then we give it to you for your full three-year verification. Um, if you have three or more, however, you don't get verified. Each criteria is, is labeled either as a type 1 or type 2. So what is the verification process in and of itself? Verification happens every three years. As I mentioned, we just had one in March 2018, so our next one will be probably March 2021. We actually have to apply for this about a year and a half in advance. After we apply and they are able to settle on our dates, they assign us our dates. Once our dates are assigned, they give us they send to us what they call a pre-review questionnaire, the PRQ. And basically, this is a document in which we explain our entire trauma program, starting from geographical location even, to population, down to the nitty gritty of how many nurses do we have, what's your certifications, what's your years of experience, to how many patients, to what levels were they um, a level of care where they admit it to, how many crannies did you do, how many ICP monitors did you put in. It's a very large document. This year we ended up, uh, I think it was about 75 pages. So this is an important document though because this document is, has to be turned in to the VRC 30 days prior to our site survey because what happens is the VRC assigns two reviewers to us. The reviewers are almost always a member of the COT, they're a member of the VRC, and they're usually trauma medical directors, very similar to Dr. Constantini, basically. Um, and they come and they go through our, the criteria to see uh, all our, if, if we're doing what we say we do. So they take this PRQ and they read through it, and then when they come here, one of the things that they will do is they'll, during the site survey, they're going to do, say, a hospital tour. And so they're going to want to go see the OR. And they're going to go to the OR section of that PRQ. And they're going to walk up to an OR nurse and say, how many teams do you have on call? And her answer had better be what I put in the PRQ. So they're really double checking that we are doing what we say we are doing. Um, I believe Sandy was in the trauma bay when we came in this year, and one of the things they asked us is, do you have a pediatric trauma card? And the answer was, yes, and then they said, show me your Braslow tape. <laughs> so they're verifying we're doing what we say we're doing. So the PRQ is a very important document to make sure that we get correct. So during the site survey, these two reviewers will come in, and it's an organized agenda. So what I mean by that is, the VRC actually sets the agenda, and it's the same for every trauma center because they want to make sure that the criteria that they are judging us on is the same that they're judging every other trauma center. So the agenda and the criteria that they want during this site survey is the same for everybody. So nobody can say that somebody was harder on them than they were on somebody else or any of that other drama. But usually the first day is starts off with the reviewers coming in and doing a chart review. You can see down here on this picture a bunch of buckets. Those buckets are full of charts. So during, in the agenda, they actually list which charts and how many they want to see. So they want to see the most recent 30 death charts. They want to see patients that had ISSs of greater than 25. They want to see what patients did you transfer out? Why did you transfer them out? <laughs> a trauma level one center, you shouldn't be transferring people out. So they want to see why. And to be honest, we, we do a very good job there. We only had one, and that's because she went to Sharp Mary Birch because she had a high-risk pregnancy. So, but we're able to justify those things, and they can see those and go, okay. Um, pediatrics, they want to review our pediatrics charts. So all in all, it was 130 charts that we prepared for them to review. 
and we actually had a, a very successful chart review with them. It went very well. You guys did an amazing job of documenting all your care, and that is what's really important during the chart review. Next is documentation. On the upper corner there, you'll see a picture full of binders. So part of the criteria in the Orange Book is that we have certain standards. So for example, we have to have a multidisciplinary uh, trauma committee. That means it has to be trauma. It has to have an ortho liaison. It has to have a neuro liaison. It has to have an anesthesia liaison. And we all have to meet, and we have to maintain 50% attendance. So in one of those books, is the notes from the meeting and an attendance records. Um, one of those books is your education binder. It's actually the big, big fat one in the middle. <laughs> you guys do a great job with education and as the ACS was very, very impressed with that. Um, also, our PI initiatives, as Dr. Constantini kind of talked to you about, uh, PI initiatives are very, very important. They're always looking for us to, they don't ever want to walk into a center and say, we're perfect. We do everything great. No, what they always want to see is that we're always reviewing ourselves and looking for opportunities for improvement. And so we should always be having some kind of PI project going. Um, after they do their chart review and their documentation review, we go into what's called a working dinner. It's not as fun as it sounds. So what they do is they take that lovely PRQ to dinner with them and we invite liaisons that go to our multidisciplinary uh, meetings with us. So Sandy Schwartz is our ortho liaison. Um, Anish is our anesthesia liaison. So all these folks are So all these folks get, and we invite our administration, so our CEO, CMOs, we invite all our nurse managers we invite all our trauma doctors, and we sit around this U-shaped table with the two reviewers up front, and they start asking each person questions relevant from the PRQ to see, are their answers going to match what we put here? And maybe to dive down into a little few more questions. So it's a really a, a, a grilling session. Um, usually takes a few hours, and so usually this day of chart review organization starts about 7 a.m., and we're usually done around 10 p.m. So it's, it's a, quite an endeavor. Um, the next day, we'll start with a hospital tour, and that's what I said. Again, they take that PRQ around, and they go to the blood bank. They go to CT. They go to MRI. They want to know at CT, are you really staffed 24 hours a day for trauma patients at MRI? Are you staffed 24 hours a day? If you're not, What's your on call? How fast do they have to be here? How can you prove they got here in that time? So it's, it's a very interesting little scenario. And then after that, they go back to the room and they can continue chart review if needed, or they kick us out. And they sit down and discuss their findings and compare notes. And then they call us back in for an exit interview. Now, during the exit interview, it's usually trauma medical director, trauma program manager, and administration. And this is where you sit here biting your nails going, oh, please, oh, please. And they go through and tell you how you did in their eyes. It's not an official report, but they will tell you, did you have any critical deficiencies? Were they a type 1 or a type 2? And then they will tell you what they found are your strengths of your program and your weaknesses of your program. And so after that process, they then take a written report and they submit it back to the VRC. So you're not done yet because the VRC then takes their written report and they review it. And if they see any anomalies, they can kick it back to you. So it's not until you get the final report from the VRC that you're done and you know you've successfully completed your verification. Any questions on the process? So what is a verified level one trauma center? You'll hear this, you know, quite frequently people will say it's because we do research and education. It's true. It's true. But actually what a level one trauma center really is about is being a regional resource so, for example, El Centro. 
We get transfers from El Centro all the time, and you're probably thinking to yourself, why is this very stable person coming through my trauma bay? Why can't they just be a direct admit? We already have all their labs, we already have their scans. Why are they coming through the trauma bay? Well, El Centro is only a level uh, four trauma center. So ACS says if we receive a transfer from a lower level, they have to go through our trauma bay because we want to make sure they're getting a proper trauma workup. So it's actually a requirement from ACS that we do this. Um, but what's so, it's very important to, as a level one trauma center that we are available for the smaller centers that aren't a trauma center at all, such as Sharp Coronado, where we get many transfers from, and uh, Scripps Chula Vista, not a trauma center again. So even though they might have had a workup, they haven't had a trauma workup. And so we as a level one center have to be a resource for these other centers that maybe not our trauma center or a lower trauma center. It's one of the things that is very important to, uh, to, to maintaining a verified level one status is to prove that we're supporting these other hospitals. Um, the facility must be capable of leadership um, from every aspect, injury, prevention, rehab. So we have an injury and prevention coordinator we have to prove that we have an injury prevention coordinator. We have to prove that she has that title, and we have to prove that that's her only job. Uh, injury prevention should be focused on our catchment, and it should be also focused on our top three mechanisms. So that's what our injury prevention coordinator, Jan Faree, you might someone else come out from her occasionally asking for volunteers for different things. It's part of being a level one trauma center. As we discussed, education, research, prevention, and system planning. So what's system planning? Well, we in San Diego, you've probably heard many times through your trauma orientations and different things about how wonderful San Diego County's trauma system is because we were one of the first. Well, it's actually a requirement that we do system planning to be a level one center. So every month we meet with all the other trauma centers and the County of San Diego at a monthly meeting we call the uh, Medical Audit Committee, the MAC, the trauma program managers, trauma directors, and representatives from the county and pre-hospital are all there. And we talk about issues with the system in and of itself. And we try to make policies to help correct. And we have to have adequate depth of resources and personnel. So as we talked about, as a trauma level one center, we should have the resources. We should not have to transfer patients out so very often we will get um, from, say, uh, Sharp Memorial, they're a trauma level two. They might have to transfer a patient to us because they don't do burn, they don't do replantation, they don't do microvascular surgery. That's why they're a trauma level two. So always keeping in mind, as a level one, we should have the resources and the depth of personnel. We should never have to go on bypass because we can't get a second OR opened up. We have the personnel to do it. So, what's an example of a type 1 critical deficiency for a level 1 trauma center? Now, this is for level 1. It applies to level 2, 3, 4s as well. But what we have to always have is an attending surgeon who is making the therapeutic decisions has to be present at the resuscitation room and is always present for operative procedures. We have to offer a, we can have a resident start the trauma. But the trauma attending must come in at some point to, to uh, finish the trauma. Uh, neuro, neuro, they have to be available at all times for TBI, spinal cord injuries, and they must be present within 30 minutes of call time. In cases where patients are admitted or transferred, the care must be timely appropriate and monitored by the PIPS program. So our, our patient um, safety program, Performance Improvement Patient Safety, PIPS. P so every two weeks, I meet with all the trauma surgeons and say, I've reviewed these charts. I see these standards of care weren't done. Can we, let's talk about them and let's adjudicate them. Do we need education? What do we need to do to make sure that this doesn't happen again? So everybody must have this um, PI program in place. And when they come, that's one of the binders that we show them is here's our meeting agenda, here was what was documented, here's what we did, and we always have to close the loop. Here's how we corrected it. 
or here's how it's an ongoing process that we're still monitoring. Um, anesthesia residents can take care of trauma patients, but a actual anesthesia attending must be available within 30 minutes. At minimum, a trauma level one center must also have continuous rotations in the trauma surgery for senior residents. So again, education is important to being a trauma level one center. So what are type twos? So programs that admit more than 10% of injured patients to non-surgical service must review all non-surgical admissions through the PIPS program. So trauma patients should be admitted to the trauma service. If for any reason we're not admitting them to the trauma service, we have to review this in PI and ask ourselves why we didn't. Was it what was best for the patient because we ruled them all out, tra their trauma injuries all out? However, they, had, uh, they needed more cardiac workup, so we admitted them to cardiology. Okay, that's adjudicated as acceptable and we'll move along. Um, as I discussed, we have to have a multidisciplinary peer review meeting with a 50% attendance. Um, because the skills and training and the management of acute rehab phases of muscular trauma, physical and occupational therapists and rehabilitation specialists are essential at trauma level ones and two. So we have to be able to provide these services. Orthopedic, when we call ortho for a consult, they have to be there in 30 minutes. Um, radiologists must be available within 30 minutes. Data must be collected in compliance with the National Trauma Data Standards and submitted to the National Trauma uh, data bank. So that's also known, that data also goes to TQIP, which Dr. Constantine uh, referred to earlier. We have a trauma registry, which is basically a trauma database. So every single trauma chart is reviewed by an RN, and data points and quality PI issues are abstracted during this time and submitted to the different entities. Universal screening for alcohol must be performed for all injured patients and must be documented. All injured patients, not just the ones that come in with risk factors or we know that's intoxicated, all. So what are the results from our March 2018 verification site survey? How many deficiencies did we have? There were none identified. So job well done. Thank you guys so much for all your hard work because this is your work. I'm just pulling out the proof of your work. So well done. So these are the strengths that the reviewers listed for us. That the trauma program is very involved in regional trauma and we are. Dr. Constantini is actually the uh, regional state chair to the um, COT. So he is very involved in that. Uh, we're represented in the uh, Regional um, Trauma Committee for Southern California and for the state. So we really do try to work regionally. Um, Doctor, all our faculty are, are very good about submitting research and doing presentations at different conferences and AAST, for example, is coming up. Um, they really like Dr. Constantini. Who doesn't? Um, <laughs> They really like the idea of the trauma recess nurse, recess nurse um, concept that ensure that is critical care nurses. Um, all our trauma sur surgeons are actually ATLS instructors. That's actually very rare. We have a strong collaboration. There's excellent commitment to dedicated uh, trauma resource nurses that are all critical care trained. They really like the dedicated trauma room area with the four beds with its close proximity to the OR and the ICU. They thought our neurosurgeons were very committed that ICP monitoring is used frequently and appropriately. Trauma ICU nurse education and certifications are high. Uh, trauma activations can be carried out in a dedicated operating room, so they like our OR recess. Um, PACU nurses have stepped up their trauma education uh, in that really um, that was actually one of our weaknesses in 2015, is that our PACU nurses did not have any trauma education. So we took that weakness and we worked on it, so they were very impressed with how well we did there. Um, trauma program provides many advanced courses. We do a lot of education, as you guys know. We not only offer ATLS, ADAM, ASSET. We, do um, we also do the weekly trauma conferences, so we do a lot of education. Um, robust research program. 
our research program to be a trauma level one, we have to have a minimum of 20 research papers that are up in publications. We had in that th in that three year pro, I think we had like something like 102. They were blown away, just completely blown away. They told, they said we were showing off. <laughs> The hospital has invested in a, a disaster readiness and through our drills. They really loved our disaster readiness. Um, a strong collaborations, and they really like uh, Melody Dotson, our base hospital nurse coordinator. She does a very good job with PIing uh, on her side. So opportunities for improvement. So they say that we divert um, trauma patients for OR and trauma bypass. Uh, so bypass. Standards say that we should not be on bypass more than 5% of the time. We were on bypass for 0.98% of that year, so not even 1%. Their point being is, is that we're on bypass, though, for like 15-minute increments, 20-minute increments, 30-minute increments, and they're saying to us, is, is there any way that you guys can look at that? Because that seems like maybe was it really necessary to go on for 15 minutes. But we do very well with our bypass. <laughs> 30-minute um, response criteria for orthopedic surgeons. The documentation of the 30-minute um, response times is inconsistent. Same, um, same for our washouts and our femur fracture fixations. It's just, we just don't have good documentation of these things. They can tell that we're doing them. They can tell we're doing them timely, but we don't have documentation of it. Um, they'd like to see us do a, a, a fast training for our residents. Patients admitted for less than 24 hours are inconsistently receiving alcohol screening. So alcohol screening interventions done by the social worker. If they're here for less than 24 hours, a lot of times social worker doesn't get to them. Low number of donors for number of referrals. So we had uh, 82 referrals that year. We only had eight donors. Can't make people give up their organs. All we can do is make sure the referral is done. And that there was no audit tool for the massive transfusion pro um, protocol. So. What they're going to see, want to see next in 2021 is, what would you do to address these? Well, Dr. Constantini and I have already made up an audit tool for the Master Transfusion Protocol. That one's done. Uh, we will continue, I'm working with uh, EPIC to see if there's some way we can document uh, our alcohol screening in, in a more efficient way. So we're just continuing to work on this. So what were your contributions to this? Well, your documentation allows for the ongoing monitor monitoring of these clinical standards. And so a majority of this information can only be found on your recess flow sheets, such as what time the activations happened, what time the consultants responded, what time um, to CT, to OR, time for washouts. Doctors don't, don't document washouts. This is one of the things that I'm working with in a multidisciplinary meeting. We've asked ortho to address, and hopefully they will start documenting that better. But most of the time we're getting it from the recess flow sheet. You guys are very great about putting ortho at bedside washout. Or, so um, massive transfusion timeliness, delays in care, disposition. You guys are pretty good about also putting, you know, a waiting bed, you know, a waiting MRI, whatever it is. And that's great because that allows me to say, okay, I'm having delays here. Why? Um, I know I'm kind of jumping around here. So they also said that, once again, your education that you guys get and the education that you provide is very stellar. It is a strength of our program, your high number of certifications. And, and so I would just say, great job, keep that up. Um, also having critical care nurses be our trauma nurses. This is a concept that was, is, is unique to us and they really liked. I don't know if you've ever worked at a trauma center other than this one, but almost every other trauma center, their trauma nurses are ER nurses. And so for us to have critically trained nurses as our recess nurses, they found is a, is a great strength for us. And then just continuing to provide education. I know, you know the, that the SICU provides a lot of trauma education to the PCU, and you guys do a lot of volunteering, and you've helped us out a lot with the Stop the Bleed initiative, which is big for ACS. So what are we doing to prepare for 2021? We're trying to get, tr we're gonna try to decrease our, our bypass hours. How can you help with that? Try to get patients transferred out of the recess room in a timely manner. Uh, if you're having any issues with it, 
document why. Because if you're like, I paged the uh, nursing supervisor three times and she didn't call back, I review every single one of your recess flow sheets. And when I see that, I'm gonna follow up on that on my end because we shouldn't have delays because of that. So make sure if, you're doc if you are having these kind of issues, document them so we can try to get these kinds of delays down. Um, leave no blanks. Ensure you're documenta documenting called and arrive times of the trauma team and the consults. If you didn't hear the doctor say what time the consult happened, just ask them. Because a lot of times I understand the doctors do the consults, right? Just say, hey, what time did you call? And just put 0830 per Dr. Woodward or whatever you want to put on there. So, because I know documentation should be as accurate as possible, and you didn't. You want to make sure you're like, it wasn't me. He said this. But try your best because one of the things they asked me for while they were here was a report showing them the timeliness of our neurosurgery team. And of the 48 consults, eight of them were all unknown. We just had blanks on the documentation. And say, they said, how do you know they were timely if they were unknown? Well, for every time there's not a documentation, I have to send an email to the trauma surgeon and say, was neuro timely for this patient? And they say yes, and then I attach that email to the registry. So that way I could show the reviewers, here, they were timely, we just missed the documentation. So double check your times are accurate. Sometimes you, I'll see like 1648, and then I'll see like 1448. Okay, well, they couldn't have got that scan before they got here. So double check your accuracy. And just make sure your charting reflects your patient care. Alcohol screening, we're working with the uh, social workers to facilitate this and trying to get this sooner. Um, and certification, so one of the things that I would say is continue doing the great job that you are with your certifications, maintain your certifications, and think about certifying as a TCRN in the upcoming years. Because what they want to see is that our nurses are staying current and relevant with the newest and latest and greatest of trauma care. And that's all I have. Any questions about any of this? I went a little fast at the end, so I apologize. I'm trying to catch you up. Yes? I have a question about um, getting patients, so decreasing our bypass time by getting patients out of the trauma bay. And I think we all, really, the, uh, the big issue is CT reads. Yes. Right. And um, sometimes it's, I mean, sometimes you're back up from CT, and then like 10 minutes later you have to read. It's just so inconsistent. And then sometimes you have, you're waiting four hours, four to five hours, and, yeah. and you're telling the residents that the residents are overwhelmed with seeing trauma patients. So, so finding a way of... What I would like you to do in those situations is just document it on the recess flow sheet. Because okay. like I said, I'm going to read it. And so, and I'll see, you know, delay in disposition, awaiting CT, you know, s still awaiting CT. Every day. But Every day. <laughs> document it for me. Because then... We, we kind of go, well, what is the stat read? Yeah, exactly. What's the expectation, so, though, of like, us reading our teeth? Is there an expectation that they have? The expectation is, is that they should have them within... Um, so <laughs> that, uh, that we should have those CT scans from 30 minutes to an hour. So we should have them stat. Yeah, no. At least a preliminary, not necessarily the final, but we should have a preliminary. So if you're having delays like that, you know, document it so that I can follow up on it. Because we do have a radiology trauma liaison that I can say, hey, review this chart, this chart, and this chart. Trauma nurse documented they went to CT at this time. I see that the CT was shot at this time. We didn't get results till this time. This was a delay in disposition from the trauma room by this many hours. Please follow up with me. And they will. They do a very good job of following up with me. But I, if you can document it, I can start pushing it more. And I can also take the concerns. I can say, hey, I had in this week, you know, seven documentations of delay and dispo because of CT scans to our multidisciplinary meeting because we have a liaison who comes there as well. So I have different avenues that I can follow up on these things. And at always, you know, if you, you know, I'm always available during email or anything if you think there's like a specific concern with a specific tech or anything like that. So just let me know. But if you document it that the delay is due to this, I'll follow up on it. That has not come up for quite a while. Okay. Um, I'll tell you quite honestly, the ACS reviewers said, thank God you're still paper charting. The reviewers said that. So 
I mean, I'm not saying it's never going to happen, but right now it's not a big push for us. Um, we've got a lot of things going on, and, and I don't, just don't think that's a priority at this point. And maybe by the time we make it a priority, I think it'll make it a little easier for us to get there, too. Any other questions? All right. Thank you for your time.